This is Garrett Choby, and today we will be discussing a combined open and endoscopic craniofacial resection for anesthesioneuroblastoma. Here is the patient's imaging studies. You can see he has a fairly extensive esthesioneuroblastoma, um, primarily involving the left side of his nose, but also crossing midline. And what you'll see on the sagittal MRI scan is that there's quite a bit of dural nodular enhancement that crawls up the poster table to his frontal sinus nearly to its apex. So in this particular case, we elected for a combined open and endoscopic approach in order to maximize our exposure to the posterior table of the frontal sinus where this involved dura was. And as you'll see later in the case, there's also extensive involvement of the mucosa of the frontal sinus, the hoi up to the apex of the frontal sinus, which this uh, combined open approach really allowed us to get excellent access to. And here is my neurosurgery partner, Dr. Van Gumpel, beginning with a bifrontal craniotomy. You can see a by coronal incision being carried out there in the scalp flap uh, being raised. In this case, we are leaving the pericranium uh, down onto uh, the cranium itself, and we'll raise that as a separate flap uh, just here in a moment. This allows for a very nice, robust uh, reconstruction option when you're doing a combined open and endoscopic approach. You can see here now, uh, after the, the skin has been, has been raised, uh, an incision is made out in the pericranium to allow us to raise that uh, anteriorly. Uh, again, pedicled on our supraorbital and supratrochlear vessels, as you can see here. And the next thing we're going to look to do is go ahead and access uh, the craniotomy just above our frontal sinus, as you can see in this particular case. So here are some burr holes being carried out as we enter into this area. After the osteotomies have been completed, uh, we're then go ahead and raising and, and uh, removing that bone flap, as you can see in this image. Dura is then uh, being exposed, as you can see here, and then we'll incise into the dura here momentarily. Again, because of all that nodular enhancity crawling up the posterior table of the frontal sinus to its apex, we're going to go ahead and start by removing some of that dura in this particular case just above there in order to access this area and remove that portion of the patient's disease. In this particular case, uh, we will end up cranializing the patient's frontal sinus. So as we work through this area and uh, address and remove the posterior table of the frontal sinus, we're going to, of course, remove this area for uh, disease control and tumor resection. It's also very important that the entirety of the mucosa of the frontal sinus is completely removed to reduce his risk of postoperative mucosal formation uh, or leading to other infectious etiologies. We, of course, sampled that uh, mucosa as well, and much of that frontal mucosa was involved with tumor up until, again, the apex of the frontal sinus, uh, which again was nicely accessed through our open uh, bifrontal craniotomy. Here we are now turning our attention to the intranasal portion of the case. What we'll do first is track and map out the tumor. I think it's very important to debulk the tumor that is freely hanging in the nose without any mucosal attachments, especially the area towards the nasopharynx. What that is going to allow for is uh, egress of blood into the nasopharynx, allowing that uh, egress port, if you will, in order to improve your visualization throughout the case. A large portion of the tumor has been taken already uh, for uh, permanent uh, section pathology, and we'll debulk this lower portion of the tumor with a microdebreeder, as you can see here, this portion that is simply free-flowing the nasal cavity without any mucosal attachments. Here's that last bit of tumor in the nasopharynx uh, being removed, again, to allow uh, more ready access for egress of blood flow throughout this case with this vascular tumor. We're now tracking it up onto the nasal septum, as you can see here, in the area of the patient's middle turbinate. Because the bifrontal craniotomy has already been completed, we'll be able to uh, access that area readily and see that uh, in short order. You can see here tumor is free from the lateral nasal wall in the area of the inferior turbinate towards the area of the maxillary sinus. We'll take out the rest of the left middle turbinate, as you can see here, uh, as tumor is involving it. And when dealing with sinasal malignancies from an endoscopic standpoint, again, the, the key parts with tumor dissection are to debulk those areas that are freely hanging and then closely assess the mucosal areas that it's attached to and then take wide margins around this. So as you can see here, I'm using a needle tip bovi cautery in order to incise wide margins around the nasal septal involvement, as you can see here. And then we'll sample all these areas uh, for margins as we resect this, this area. Here we are posteriorly in the nasal septum, uh, making our mucosal incisions, then coming the whole way through the septum on the contralateral side. There is some tumor involvement in the high superior septum on his right side as well. But here we are making those mucosal cuts on the left side and then performing our septectomy.
And what I typically like to do is then sample the margin on the side left in the nasal cavity. So we'll resect the area of the uh, tumor itself, and then we'll sample the, the mucosa on the side that's left in the nasal cavity. So just for some examples, here's uh, incising then checking our uh, left inferior septal margin as well as an anterior inferior septal margin. And I like to be very careful with these as I label them to ensure I know exactly where in the nasal cavity they came from. So in case anything comes back positive, we can easily go back and track that. Here we are uh, making our incisions on the lateral nasal wall. Again, uh, fairly extensive involvement here in the lateral nasal wall. So we'll make our incisions and then take our margins uh, adjacent to it. I prefer a needle tip bowie cautery, although other things can be utilized here, including a caudal elevator or other cold steel instruments. Um, obtaining and tracking the margins on the intranasal side is a very important part of this surgery. Here we are coming through and marking uh, the contralateral side and then making corresponding incisions in the patient's right side of his nasal cavity. Uh, again, we'll make our incisions here and we'll take out that septum, but then we'll mark out and take our right-sided margins as well uh, in short order. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a large nasal septal flap is not possible in a case like this due to tumor involvement of it. So in these cases, even if we would choose a purely endoscopic craniofacial resection, a pericranial flap would likely be needed for our reconstruction. However, in a case like this where we're doing a combined open and endoscopic approach, uh, the pericranial flap is already raised and accessed, and we'll drop that in from above uh, for our reconstruction later on. Here we are outlining uh, the mucosal incisions again for our right-sided uh, mucosal incisions of the nasal septum. And then we're going to go ahead and take out all that bone and cartilage and complete our septectomy. The most important thing in these cases is to completely remove the tumor and, ob and obtain negative margins. So when you think about these tumors from a philosophical perspective, uh, certainly there are different tools to do that. There's purely endoscopic approaches, there's combined approaches, and there are purely open approaches. But the bottom line is the approach you select should really be dictated by the tumor and what you're most comfortable with obtaining complete tumor resection. Here we are on the right side, uh, completing unsynectomy, and we'll open up the maxillary sinus uh, for long-term surveillance, although the tumor is not directly involved in that area. We are also anticipating that he will receive adjuvant radiotherapy, which can cause uh, scarring and chronic sinus problems in many patients. So this is also helpful to uh, prevent that long-term. Here we are now opening up the sphenoid sinus, as you can see here. I like uh, an up to millimeter kerosin for a lot of uh, the, the work back here towards the sphenoid. What you can see here is that uh, sphenoid mucosa looks very normal. Now we will also sample the areas around here to ensure it's negative as well before chalking up to being normal, but certainly has a normal clinical appearance uh, in the sphenoid sinus. Now here we are back on the left side. You're seeing the left nasopharynx there with our uh, lower septectomy defect, which will all come out here in a few moments and looking contra to the contralateral side as well. And again, we're making some incisions here in order to fully remove uh, all of the mucosa uh, in this area. We'll again sample margins as we work through this area as well, of course. And here we are completing our septectomy, bringing that bony posterior septum off the rostrum of the sphenoid and removing that in its entirety. And then bring our kerosene up again in the area where we've made our mucosal cuts and incisions. Uh, in the more anterior septum to resect that in its entirety as well. There you can see the rest of the septum coming out of the nose and just completing that uh, inferior portion as well. Now here we are working on the lateral nasal wall. We're over top of the nasal lacrimal duct in this particular shot as you can see here. We have already taken margins anteriorly and here we are peeling all the soft tissue off of that area. As I mentioned earlier, I'll go ahead and complete uh, a maxillary entrostomy to open the ethmoids on this side as well. You can see that area of the maxillary sinus is secondary obstructed and there's uh, mucopurulence in that particular area. The mucosa there is inflamed, although not directly involved with tumor, and we of course took uh, samples of it to ensure that as well uh, during the surgery. And I'll keep working here on the lateral nasal wall, uh, taking this mucosa as it transitions from uh, the lateral wall over top of the nasal lacrimal duct and towards the orbit. What you can see here is us carefully peeling uh, all of this mucosa out over this area. 
and begin to expose the bone uh, of the uh, lamina papricia and the nasal lacrimal duct. And here we are opening up the left sphenoid sinus. Again, you can see there's a lot of post-obstructive secretions within the sinus, uh, although the sinus itself was not directly involved. We, of course, sampled that mucosa as well, uh, but it was negative. You just caught a glimpse of the craniotomy from above and the telfa coming through in that particular area. I will note that uh, the anterior and posterior ethmoid arteries have already been cauterized from above, and bilateral olfactory bulbs have already been resected. Because a large portion of this bone was exposed, although not directly involved with tumor, I thought it'd be prudent to go ahead and drill down the entire of the keel of the rostrum to remove that. I find in many patients that have exposed bone following the surgery and undergo adjuvant radiotherapy, that area has a tendency to crust long-term and can cause problems with osteoradionecrosis. So I do like to remove the bulk of that bone whenever possible in order to help to prevent some of those uh, side effects of radiotherapy. Now as you look at the nasal cavity, you'll see obviously a much uh, wider view there with the majority of the septum gone and the cranial base gone. I'm now taking down the lamina papricia in order to expose the periorbita. On the patient's preoperative scans, uh, the tumor certainly abutted the orbit in this area. There is no clear intraorbital extension. So in these cases, what I typically do will uh, be remove the entirety of the lamina papricia and then remove and sample the periorbita itself to see if it's involved with tumor. If it is involved, we may, we may go ahead and resect the entirety of it. If it's clean, however, we'll typically leave the remaining portion of the periorbita in place. I like to maintain that plane uh, right along the periorbita to make sure this fat stays intact, to make sure your biopsy does not inadvertently get uh, the medial rectus. The periorbita was free of tumor in this case as well. And then again, I, I, I think it's prudent in these particular cases where the tumor abuts the nasal lacrimal duct system to go ahead and drill down the entirety of that lacrimal system and then sample uh, the lacrimal sac and the uh, other soft tissue contents in the lacrimal system to which ensure it's not involved with tumor. So here we are uh, drilling down the lacrimal system and using a 2 millimeter keras and take the rest of that bone down. There we are entering that mucosa over top of the uh, lacrimal sac as you can see there. And we'll go ahead and sample that mucosa uh, for frozen section pathology. As I mentioned earlier, in this particular case, this came back uh, negative uh, for tumor involvement. However, I do think it's really important to be extensive in these cases. I'd much rather open up someone's lacrimal system and deal with epiphora later on than to leave tumor there uh, during their resection. In my experience with radiotherapy, many of these patients will end up uh, scarring down their lacrimal system and may uh, require DCRs down the road. I have in the past uh, stented this system prophylactically, but typically what I'll do nowadays is I'll, I'll let them uh, get the radiation and heal from that, and then we'll consider uh, doing a DCR down the road. Here I am just drilling down the frontal beak, as you can see here, uh, ensuring that there's no further mucosa in that particular area, and just visualize this area better for our reconstruction and for long-term surveillance. Now we'll go ahead and get a combined look uh, both through the nose and from above. After the tumor has been resected and we've uh, achieved our negative margins, we are beginning to think about our reconstruction. Here we are just drilling down smooth, uh, again, the anterior table of the frontal sinus and uh, making sure that our flap is going to lay down there uh, very nicely on top of smooth bone. Here is one of the final views endoscopically prior to reconstruction. You can see both sphenoids there in the planum, uh, resection with telfa from above through a craniotomy defect, and then uh, what will become our new neo-frontal sinus after cranialization. For our typical reconstruction for cases such as this, what we like to do is to use our fascia lata as a primary closure as a patch in the dura, which is sutured to the dural defect. We then will lay in our pericranial flap uh, covering the entirety of the cranial base from planum uh, to uh, the remnant anterior table of the frontal sinus in orbit to orbit, and then reinforce some of those edges with additional fascia lata as needed. After we're satisfied with our reconstruction, I'll typically put some absorbable packing material in the nose. In cases like this where uh, there's very little support in the nose and the majority of intranasal contents have been resected, I will typically place some mirror cells as well. In this case, we placed uh, four gloved mirror cells underneath our packing to have nice support in that area. And here is the patient's post-operative uh, MRI scan, as you can see here. He's undergone an extensive uh, resection, cranialization of the frontal sinus, and then reconstruction with a uh, pericranial uh, flap as well as fascia lot of graft, as you can see here.
with the uh, neo dura laid up there. And here is him postoperatively uh, about f- a month or so after surgery. Things have been uh, opened. He's been uh, debrided, and you can see some crusting there along that uh, pericranial graft, which happens in most of these cases. When considering sinus malignancy resection, such as esthesioneuroblastoma, in many cases we are able to complete this with a purely endoscopic anterior cranial base resection. However, the extent of tumor will dictate the approach that's needed. In a case such as this, with extensive dural involvement along the posterior table of the frontal sinus and frontal sinus mucosa itself, we elected for a combined open and endoscopic uh, approach. This allows a bit better access for tumor removal as well as a nice reconstruction with a pericranial flap when things like a septal flap are not available for reconstruction. The most important part of considerations for these cases is a complete resection of tumor with negative margins and selection of the approach is dictated by what will give you the greatest chance of achieving that. Long-term surveillance is needed and many patients will also go on to receive adjuvant therapy such as radiation or in select cases, chemotherapy.